Hello listeners, it's Andrea and I am back. I know I have left you hanging for a while and I apologize. I've been moving into a new home slash headquarters for the podcast and battling health issues with me and my son and it has just been quite a hectic month. And on top of that, I am having technical difficulties with Autoy's last episode And I don't want to leave you hanging anymore, so I will be posting a new episode with a new story and hoping to get all toys finished up here. A-S-A-P. Stay at home. Tell all whom you know that are thinking of coming that they have to sacrifice everything and face danger in all its forms. For thousands have laid and will lay their bones along the routes to and in this country. Tell all that death is in the pot. The natives of these mountains are wild, live in small huts made of brush, and go naked as when they were born. They subsist on acorns and what game they kill with their bows and arrows. They are small in stature, and their character is timid and friendly in nature. They are charged with killing miners occasionally when they find one alone, away among the hills hunting. The miners, especially the organ men, are sometimes guilty of the most brutal acts with him, such as killing the squaws and papooses. Such incidents have fallen under my notice that would make humanity weep and men disown their race. Queens of the Mines features the authentic stories of gold rush women who blossomed from the camouflaged, twisted roots of California. In the next episodes, we will hear the story of the Queen of Devotion in the California gold mines. Much of the story is told in the own words of this entrepreneur who knew how to capitalize on her strengths and proved that some men in the Old West would eventually tire of strong, successful women during America's largest migration, the Gold Rush. The preceding program features stories that contain adult content, which may be disturbing to some listeners or secondhand listeners. So, discretion is advised. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Columbia Mercantile 1855. Columbia Mercantile 1855 is a reimagined Gold Rush era general store in Columbia State Historic Park. As a young child, the owner, Teresa, who reopened the store late spring of last year, was transplanted to the historic township of Columbia and spent her days playing in the tree-lined streets and panning for gold with the old timers, listening to the old stories of Columbia and the Motherload. Teresa is serving both local residents and state park visitors living history and offering high quality grocery staples from local suppliers. That's right, you may think it looks like a museum when you walk in there, but this is a real functioning mercantile. There is a little bit of hardware, garden, housewares, gifts, antiques, an original fine art in the Argonne Art Gallery, and groceries. And if you don't see it, it's probably just tucked away. She has it. Just ask Teresa. She is radical. I'm not kidding. I love this woman. Just let her know what you're looking for, and she's happy to help you find it. The Columbia Mercantile 1855 is a great place to discover a treasure trove of gold standard products for your modern life so important to shop local and if you are a mother load resident and you wanted to help out Teresa and the podcast make one of your monthly grocery shopping trips down to the mercantile and enjoy a little bit of time in Columbia while you're there Columbia Mercantile 1855 is located in the most interesting building at 11245 Jackson Street Columbia State Historic Park you may know it the red brick building with its iconic green iron doors. Open daily from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
Queens on the Minds is looking for sponsors and advertisers. New and old episodes are being downloaded every day in over 25 countries and almost every single state. If you're interested in sponsoring the continuation of Queens of the Minds, email southernmindqueen at gmail.com. In generally the white and Protestant families, there was an ideology or value system the most prominent actively promoted. It asserted new ideas of femininity, the cult of true womanhood in the early 19th century that tied a woman to four cardinal virtues. Piety, purity, domestic, and submissiveness. This worked with the separate spheres philosophy, a philosophy that split everything and everyone into two different spheres for men and women, public life and private life. In the home, the private sphere were the women who managed the household and the children. In the private sphere, the responsibility included serving and obeying the husband. She was to practice morality and teach her family religion. Social prejudice excluded the working class, immigrants, and blacks. The public sphere included politics, commerce, and law. This considered the men's responsibility, for women were considered childlike and unable to make decisions. It was almost dusk, as Luzina Wilson, a Quaker woman, wrote in her diary. I thought where he could go, I could, and where I went, I could take my two little toddling babies. Mother-like, my first thought was of my children. I realized the task I had undertaken. If I had, I think I should still be in my log cabin in Missouri. But when we talked it all over, it sounded like such a small task to go out to California and once there, fortune, of course, would come to us. The first man we met was about 50 miles above Sacramento. He had ridden on ahead, bought a fresh horse and some new clothes, and was coming back to meet his train. The sight of his white shirt, the first I had seen for four long months, revived me in the languishing spark of womanly vanity. And when he rode up to the wagon where I was standing, I felt embarrassed, drew down my ragged sunbonnet over my sunburned face, and shrank from observation. My skirts were worn off in rags above my ankles. My sleeves hung in tatters above my elbows, my hands brown and hard, gloveless. Around my neck was tied a cotton square, torn from a discarded dress. The soles of my leather shoes had long ago parted company with the uppers. And my husband, children, and all the camp were habited like myself in rags. We slept on the mattress lying on the floor of the wagon. Nothing but the actual experience will give one an idea of the plotting unvarying monotony, the vexations, the exhaustive energy, the throbs of hope, the depths of despair through which we lived. Luzina Wilson, her husband Mason, their two boys, her brothers, and their wives had left with a train of five wagons in May on her 30th birthday. Their one-room log home remained back home in Missouri. In it stayed most of their belongings. 
the exception of two Bibles, two quilts, one dress, a bonnet, a pair of shoes, and a few pieces of china she packed away in their prairie schooner. Possessions that soon mostly would be lost or left behind on the trail. Household items and shallow graves littered the crowded trails as a steady stream of 49ers and their thin, thirsty, tired livestock traveled across the country at two miles an hour, slower than the speed of the spreading cholera. In Sacramento, surrounded by the twinkling campfires of the new arrivals, Luzina got to building her campfire to prepare supper for her famished family. Canvas tents in every direction, showing themselves with the flickering of their flames. Everywhere Luzina looked, men were laughing and passing whiskey, playing cards or rolled up in blankets, sleeping, exhausted from months of travel. As she prodded the fire and prepared her dough, she wished the men would share just a sip of their whiskey, for they had been long out. She thought of the next day in Sacramento. Hopefully, Mason could find gold quickly, for they would soon be out of supplies and money. From the shadows, a hungry miner approached her. I'll give you five dollars, ma'am, for them biscuit. She scoffed at him until she read his face. He was as serious as a heart attack. Luzina hesitated at such a remarkable proposition. Five dollars was over two weeks of a man's wage back at home for a biscuit. I'll give you five dollars, ma'am, for them biscuit and ten more dollars for bread made by a woman. He pressed a rather impressive, shining gold piece into her palm. Eureka. Later that night, as Luzina slept, she dreamt of thousands of bearded miners striking gold from the earth with every blow of the pick. A part of each of those golden nuggets promptly delivered to her. Luzina and her family rode to a new camp the next morning, fantasizing about her dream the night before the whole ride. When they settled in, she went to retrieve the gold she had earned the night before, eager to restock supplies at Sutter's Fort. The little black box she had stored the nugget in was gone. It must have rolled to the bottom of the wagon, the contents somewhere on the dusty trail behind them. That night, Luzina wrote in her diary, The nest egg was gone, but the homely bird which laid it, the power and will to work, is still there. Are you enjoying the podcast? Please, right now, push pause and go rate, review, and subscribe. It's super important. It's the only way to spread the word in the podcast world. If you would like to contribute or donate and get rewarded for it, check out the Patreon program on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Queens of the Minds. Are you interested in supporting local artists and artisans in the mother load? Even if you're not locally here from California and you are enjoying our podcast and want to support the art that comes from the people that live here in gold country, check out thebop209.com. The Bright Orange Poppy is a website that promotes and educates people about local artists, artisans, bakers, catering companies, musicians, you name it. You can subscribe to thebop209.com if you want to learn about new artists and upcoming artisans in the mother load, there also will be an article about a podcast about gold rush women that you may know of hint, hint on the website soon. The bop 209com also has the bop shop. And this is especially awesome. If you would like to purchase items made by artists, artisans, or services 
in the mother load, you can go to this website and do so. It's a one-stop shop. If you are an artist, artisan, musician, catering company, photographer in the mother load, and you want to be featured or sell your merchandise on this site, that is also something that you can do at thebop209.com. You can also find them on Instagram and Facebook at the Bop 209 The Bright Orange Poppy is ran by Emily Kingston, and it is a female-owned business here in the Motherlode. Please show your support and go subscribe to thebop209.com. Okay, back to the story. Mason Wilson kneeled at the bed of the American River, his corked glass vial holding... A small amount of gold dust. Filthy, he dug, picked, and shook the dirt from the daybreak until it was too dark to see the difference between rocks in his pan. Defeated, he slowly began to walk home after four days and nights upriver, empty-handed. How would he explain his immediate failure to Luzina? It had taken them five months to get to California, and they gave up everything to chase this dream of his. Luzina most likely had ran out of the remaining supplies, and he was in fear of the outcome of leaving her to manage the camp and their rowdy young boys all by herself. Mason, finally just outside of his camp, moved towards his canvas tent, and as he approached, he heard a commotion. His pace quickened and he reached for his knife, ready to defend whatever drunks were surely making the noise and surely harassing his bride. He turned the corner from behind the covered wagon and astonished at what was taking place stopped dead in his tracks. Near two campfires, at a row of plank tables that had not been there when he departed, sat 20 dining miners. They were whooping and hollering for the good food and in awe of his sons who were entertaining the tired 49ers, doing a jig and reviving the men's aching souls. Mason spotted his wife across the furthest fire, pouring hot coffee into an elderly Chilean man's tin cup. She looked up and saw her husband gazing towards her in disbelief. Their eyes locked. She was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. What a fool he had been to not see her own potential outside of this marriage and home. The shame and the realization gutted him. As they laid in the bed that night, Luzina told Mason that had been, in fact, the third seating of men that came for dinner that evening, each man paying one whole dollar for the meal, and she expected them all to return for breakfast and dinner tomorrow, and the days that followed. Pay dirt. Mason had been worrying for no reason. The morning before, Luzina had sold off the remaining oxen from the journey and bought a stake in the small hotel business and supplies from the successful Sam Brandon store in New Switzerland. While Mason was away panning the river, Luzina was hard at work with her own pan over a fire, preparing a meal to feed an army. Nearly twice as many dirt-covered men lined up the outside of the Wilson's Hotel the next morning. Word traveled fast. There was an American woman with domestic skills in Sacramento. Unheard of. Dropping the dough into a sizzling pan, she took one moment to take a breath and tilted her head back to kiss the sky, the sunbeams warming her face. The flap of a bird's wings caused her to open her eyes. Settling into a tree above her gaze was the majestic, fully grown bald eagle who had visited her each day since the Wilson family's arrival. The bald eagle and Luzina acknowledged each other. All the places you can go and you just want to watch me make biscuits. Did that bird just nod at her? In Sacramento, customers were happy to pay the high price tag for a meal prepared by Luzina Wilson, for the white woman was a rarity. 
serving up to 200 boarders a week and charging each $25. Her success afforded the establishment a true building with a roof, tables, and employees. Sourcing the ingredients remained the largest challenge for Luzina in the beginning. My first purchase was a quart of molasses for a dollar and a slice of salt pork as large as my hand for the same price. That pork, by the by, was an experience. When it went into the pan, it was as innocent-looking pork as I ever saw it. But no sooner did it touch the fire than it pranced, sizzled, frothed over the pan, sputtered, crackled, and acted as if possessed. When finally it subsided, there was left a shaving the size of a dollar and my pork had vanished into smoke. I found that many of our purchases were just as deceptive, for the long trip around the horn was not calculated to improve an article which was probably inferior in quality when it left New York. The flour we used was often soured, and from a single sieve full, I had sifted out at one time a handful of long black worms. The butter was brown from age and had spent a year on the way to California. I once endeavored to freshen some of this butter by washing it first in chloride of lime and afterwards churning it with fresh milk. I improved it in a measure for it became white, but it still retained its strength. It was, however, such a superior article to the original Boston butter that my boarders ate as a luxury. Strange to say, in a country overrun with cattle as California was in early days, fresh milk and butter were unheard of. And I often sold what little milk was left from my children's meals for the enormous price of a dollar a pint. Luzina put her boys to bed and under a dim light wrote out her list of goods needed for the next week. She would make her largest purchase yet in the morning. Six months had passed in Sacramento and during that half a year, Luzina had crossed paths with only two other white women. Her business had been established and now she longed for a friend. She sat down her steel dip pen, blew out the beeswax candle next to it and laid down beside Mason. Rain began to furiously pound on the family home's weak roof and it did not stop all night. Queens of the Minds was written, produced, and narrated by me, Andrea Anderson. The theme song in San Francisco Bay is by DBUK with the members of Slim Cessna's Auto Club, who is on tour soon. You can find the links to their music, tour dates, and merchandise, as well as the links to our social media and research links on the Podbean page at queensoftheminds.podbean.com. All right, we have endured the cold winter and spring is upon us and that gives us just enough time to get our skin ready by summer. And if you're like me, you get all sweaty in the summer and your skin's got to look all fresh because your makeup don't stay on very good. <laughs> TMI? Oh, wow. We're friends, right? Try Unique's customizable and innovative Uology skincare regimen. Uology is skincare mixed and made by you. Begin by choosing three of the six booster options for the Uology cleanser to target your individual skin concerns. You can prime your skin for moisturizing with the Uology Serum, a serum that absorbs quickly and is packed with skin nourishing ingredients. Hand select any three customizable boosters to personalize your serum to your skincare needs. And you can create and customize your day moisturizer by adding any three of the five interchangeable booster options. And to top it off, the Skin Nourishing Cream transforms your skincare solution when you mix in three boosters of your choice. And rest easy knowing that this night cream is doing the work while you fall fast asleep. Uology is next level skincare, a match made in heaven. 
Check out UALG companion products from cleaning sticks and cloths and masks that exfoliate, control, and brighten, complementing your customizable UALG skincare regimen. And when you purchase it, you are supporting Queens of the Minds at uniqueproducts.com slash Queens of the Minds. Before we go, I want to talk about something important. Did you know that four out of five of our Native women are affected by violence today? The U.S. Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. Learn more at www.csvanw.org slash MMIW. The hashtag MMIW stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. The least you can do is become aware. Until recently, historians and the public have dismissed conflict history and important elements are absolutely necessary for understanding American history have been downplayed or virtually forgotten. If we do not incorporate racial and ethnic conflict in the presentation of the American experience, we will never understand how far we have come and how far we have to go. No matter how painful, we can only move forward by accepting the truth. I'm Andrea Anderson, and thank you for taking the time to listen today. Let's meet again next time on Queen's of the Mines. In San Francisco Bay, San Francisco Bay, I swim most every day, I swim most every day, I take us from the Golden Gate, I'm dodging, I'm dodging, I'm dodging, I'm dodging, I'm dodging. They are always so bright. They are always so bright. I'm there saying it's alright. Saying it's alright. Salt water burns our eyes. I cry, it's natural. It's natural. It's natural. It's natural. Swept away. Death ears don't hear me say. 